Welcome everyone and uh, welcome to everyone online as well. Uh, my name is Bruce Weston. I'm the chair of the Department of Sociology here at Columbia and we're here today to discuss and celebrate a superb new book, uh, Dead Reckoning by my great colleague Diane Vaughan. And Diane is a professor of sociology, uh, sociology and a distinguished sociologist of human relationships, of organisations, of technology. Uh, Dead Reckoning is Diane's fourth book, and it follows her milestone publication, uh, The Challenger Launch Decision, that analysed the catastrophic crash of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Dead Reckoning returns to the area of aviation, this time studying the remarkable human achievement of air traffic control. Uh, the great hallmarks of Diane's work, in my view, are a relentlessly sociological view of technology that is inextricable from the social relationships that work, sometimes with mixed success, uh, to construct shared understanding. Like her earlier work, Dead Reckoning, is rigorously empirical, impressively so, I would say, and beautifully written. It's a model of historical ethnography and a great intellectual achievement. Uh, we have a wonderful panel to discuss uh, the book this evening. Uh, first, Diane will introduce us to the analysis of Dead Reckoning. Uh, next, we'll hear from my colleague, Gil Eyal, Professor of Sociology here at Columbia. Gil himself, has written powerfully about the sociology of expert judgment, its organization and social construction. Uh, one of the things I really love about Diane's work is the way it creates conversations between the social sciences and the physical sciences. And tonight is no different. And following Gil, uh, we'll hear from Venkat Venkata uh, Subramanian. Uh, Venkat is a chemical engineer and the Samuel Rubin Peter G. Vile Professor of Chemical Engineering at Columbia's School of Engineering and Applied Science. And to round out the panel, uh, we're fortunate to welcome online uh, Ido Tavori, who's uh, a professor and wonderful ethnographer uh, from NYU's Department of Sociology. So uh, that's the lineup for this evening. And without further ado, I'll invite Diane uh, to speak to us about her wonderful new book, Dead Reckoning. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming both here and online and especially Ido. It's I think seven in the morning or eight in the morning where he is. Um, originally this book was located firmly in the present. I had written three books on how things go wrong in organizations, and I was interested in how air traffic controllers get things mostly right. Um, I answered my questions, but along the way I discovered how much history mattered. And then the book became an historical ethnography that investigates the relationship between institutional persistence, change, and agency. The research encompasses the life course of the system from system emergence through 2017. Over the life course, the system persisted and increased in safety. This despite the actions of powerful social actors in the institutional environment that created periods of decline when risk increased. Moreover, in recent history, the system survived two crises, the first when then President Ronald Reagan fired over 14,000 striking air traffic controllers in 1981, and the September 11th attacks was the second. So uh, surprisingly, these two crises, two shocks actually to the system were absorbed by the existing structure rather than eliminating or destroying parts of it or changing its basic direction or being taken over by privatization or single corporate ownership. So I had to ask the question of persistence and what role controllers can play in that. My starting research questions were, what makes the system so safe or is it? 
And what is it the controllers do that technology can't replace? Uh, the research was done at four facilities in the New England region. The first was uh, Boston Tower at Logan Airport, then Boston TRACON or Terminal Radar Approach Control, which is a radar um, middle altitude facility that guides planes into and out of the airport. Boston Center, a high altitude facility in Nashville, New Hampshire. And then the last was Bedford Tower in Bedford, Massachusetts, which is a very small airport, but they have a, a, an interesting traffic in, in a heavy operations, especially in the summer. The, um, I chose the, these four because they represent the four types of work that air traffic controllers do. And besides that, they exchange airplanes with each other, therefore representing a microcosm of the, of the larger system. I did three field interventions. Initially, I'd only planned one. And the first one was 2000 to March 2000 through June 2001. And then on September 11th, the two hijacked planes that terrorists flew out of Boston Logan into the Twin Towers were handled by three of my four facilities. And in an unprecedented action nationwide, air traffic controllers brought down, cleared the sky of over 4,000 planes in less than two hours and 15 minutes without incident. This was the point at which the project became an historical ethnography because I had understood how they had pulled this off. And I saw the impact of history on the system. And then by the time I had that written up, they had automated and since I wanted to know what air traffic controllers do that technology can replace. What could I do? So I went back in 2017 for yet a third time. Um, my focus in the research from the beginning was to look at the relationship between system effects and dead reckoning. Dead reckoning being drawn from an early marine navigational term about referring to the prediction of objects in space um, without benefit of direct observation or direct evidence and deducing it. So it was the DED from deduce was where dead reckoning originally came from. And system effects are the link between historic events, actors and actions in the institutional environment as they affect the organizational system, changing it, the workplace, and the interpretation, meaning, and actions of the people who work there. But this is not a top-down model because I was equally interested in the reactions of controllers and administrators and other people who work there. So the research consisted of mostly uh, of archival data, ethnography, and interviews. I was at each facility 12 hours a day so I could see parts of two different shifts. Um, I sat with controllers, plugged in with them, listening to them and how they coordinated with pilots and, and with each other. During low times, they could talk to me. Outsiders watching cannot follow what they're seeing on the screen or what, what they're doing. So interviews were equally important, but they taught me. Um, and then I can remember the second week that I was at the center, I was watching, they're seeing just data blocks on the screen. And I said, this is, this is chaos. I don't see what you're doing. And so he said, pointing at his scope, see this guy over here? He's coming across the ocean he tracks. He's been flying all night, big Lufthansa. He's tired. Now I've got to get him from here, over to here and down to there. But see right here, all these little guys, we don't know what they're doing, maybe parachutes, but I've got to keep him out of their way. So I'm going to move this guy over here and this guy up here, and I'm going to bring him over and down like that, dead right. And so I also learned the details of, of their technique, of their expertise. Like they're, I'm not going to tell you now because it will run us too long, but I'm telling you building the stack is a thing of beauty. They, um, when they can't put their airplane through to the next 
person's airspace, they put you in a circle and you don't know, but you're in a corkscrew going down and they pull them out at the bottom. But there are dictates. Um, from casual comments, the stress of this, I had conceptual ideas. The stress of this job is in the airplanes. It's the people you work with. Three different people told me that just in conversation. And that, uh, that doesn't refer to the personalities of the people, though that could be a problem, uh, working with the same people every day. But to the, air, the problem of getting your plane across airspace boundaries and other people who won't accept your airplanes unless it's put in a certain way. A union presence, the union president told me the power is upside down in this organization. And if you need verification, look who goes home at five o'clock and look who's here evenings and weekends. Um, and finally, I just, there are, a lot, there are lots of these, but on the lunch line at the center, I was talking with the air traffic controller behind me. And he said, we come from all walks of life but we are bound together by that little freeze-all of terror we feel when we think we have mixed, missed something. And that became the title of my little freeze-all of terror of my September 11th chapter. Major themes um, across patterns across all of the facilities were historical contingency and unanticipated consequences the changing nature of work over time, training from skill to expertise, and the fundamental transformation of controllers, both their skills, visual, hearing, um, perceptual, prior prioritizing, and including for most of them a fundamental change in their persona. They become controlling and other characteristics that they have in common the liabilities of technological and organizational innovation. Variation in the airspace as a, a facility owns as it affects the facility architecture, technology, tasks, and culture of a place such that, for example, no towers, no two towers are alike because of the patterns of their airspace and runways. Key micro-level concepts answer the questions of what do controllers do that technology can't replace. Dead reckoning is a general concept, which I found operates at three different levels, controllers, air traffic administrators, and institutional actors predicting future outcomes. Ethnocognition. Ethnocognition is an anthropological term um, that was created by Clifford Gertz that designed to, to explain to anthropologists that their basic task was to, um, not to observe, but observe the native view, not impose their views on the other. But in this research, it becomes a sociological concept. Not only is it distributed beyond the room, which Hutchins would hold, but it is layered as DiMaggio talks about in culture and cognition, it is layered from the, the in, institutional environment through the organization and through them. So cognition, cognition is shaped. Boundary work becomes a really a key process. Controllers do two kinds of boundary work. One is they move airplanes off the invisible boundaries and lines in the sky across them. And second, in doing that, they have to contact other controllers, so they're also moving across the boundaries of the physical plants on the ground. But, but boundary work in this book comes in a variety. The kind of types of boundary work that, uh, that Lamont and Molnar described that is social, structural, cultural, and symbolic boundary work it, we see them enacting in in those as well. And then also boundaries, boundary work is power work by certain actors. And the final one is repair, um, especially in the, the 12th chapter. They, we can see controllers, 
Let me go back historically. I'm going individually and collectively in controllers' routine daily work in periods of decline and crisis. They were problem solving actors are engaged in repair. This uh, ability to repair became uh, belong to controllers in the 1990s when uh, Clinton was president, who empowered them legally to participate in the creation and development in, uh, of technological and organizational innovations. So across the years, they developed great sophistication in it because standardized changes have to be improvised upon to fit the local situation. How can we fix this here? And so by the time I was in the facilities, people were special math subject matter experts. And in, the, in this last chapter, the system was in crisis and they were trying to fix it. And they engaged in symbolic, physical, social, and whatever the other word is, cultural, <laughs> <laughs> cultural boundaries. Thank you very much. Oh, I want to, one other thing. It's these four things in combination that constitute what controllers do that technology can't replace. Thanks, Diane. Gil? It's a good title, huh? Mm -hmm. Dead Reckoning. I've been walking around now for weeks with this book and on my uh, arm, and I can see people on the subway <laughs> looking at me <laughs> with curiosity. <laughs> it's a new one by Jeffrey Archer or maybe by <laughs> Jane Harper. <laughs> oh, it's thick. You know, I can see them salivating. You know, the idea of uh, you know, 600 pages of murder and suspense <laughs> and plot twists. I hate to uh, disappoint them and tell them that dead here comes from deductive, <laughs> as in the skill of being able to, you know, predict where an airplane is going to be a few minutes from now. But I want to say to them, uh, there's plenty of action here, plenty of drama. You have no idea how miraculous, what a miraculous thing this book is. This book is what happens when the irresistible force meets with the immovable rock and kapow. Because what is an air traffic controller? Uh, an air traffic controller is somebody who maximizes time and who is obsessively, overwhelmingly conscious of time in its smallest increments. As Diane puts it in the book, they are supremely conscious of time, schedule, efficiency, impatient with delays. They prioritize, organize, they have in mind plan A and plan B. Automatically in everyday social situations, they multitask and scan. This is an occupation when you can get your head smacked by a clipboard because the trainer standing behind you just lost it completely because you wasted four seconds. Four precious seconds um, that you could have used to build a hole where you could have put the next airplane coming around the bed and you wasted it. Pow! Right? Um, air traffic controllers are the sort of people who, when they go to sleep, they don't count sheep. They line them up on the runway, build a nice <laughs> hole for the next errand sheet, and expedite, expedite, expedite. That's relaxing for them. They even say it's boring. So there you have your irresistible force. But on the other side, you have the hands down the best ethnographer I know. And ethnographer is also conscious of time, but in a completely different way. Ethnographic time is long and patient. An ethnographer doesn't move things along. She must wait until things happen. And she takes the time to observe how time is organized, measured and experienced by local actors. And she takes the time to observe what happens during long intervals of time when it seems like nothing happens. She asks the same questions again and again of different people, all of the same people at different times. And she revisits after 9-11, as you've heard, um, so ethnographic time is the exact opposite of controller's time. And among ethnographers, there's nobody more patient than they are. Hell, this book took 20 years. <laughs> so there you have your immovable rock. And they clash. 
After a month in one facility, a controller asks her, aren't you done yet? <laughs> we are used to finishing something and moving on. We never take work home. This would drive us nuts. So the answer is, you know, for ethnographers, three or four weeks in one place is nothing. I'm still getting my bearings. All jobs have tasks that must be performed on schedules and deadlines that have to be met. And the differences between the tasks, time schedule, and productivity in air traffic control in my academic training and experience indicated these meanings were culturally and occupationally specific. Understatement of the year, Diane. <laughs> they are all about finishing something and moving on. Finishing something and moving on. They never take work home. Against the pressure of this irresistible force, we become aware that ethnographic time consciousness is all about preserving. Preserving and recording even what seems to be of no consequence. Uh, what doesn't seem to bear mention. Preserving even when nothing seems to have happened. If you are an ethnographer, you record it, you preserve it. You do not move on. You take it home with you. You turn it over in your head. You find a place for it in your notes. Then you reorganize your notes and you find a different place for it. Now it fits in a different story. Can you fathom the amazing skill that has gone into writing this book 20 years after these little seemingly insignificant events have transpired? They are recalled in exquisite detail and their emotional bearing is conveyed and they fit into several interwoven stories told in this book. Now the clash of course is between um, the time of practice uh, driven to its utmost logic, logic by the need to, be, to keep pushing tin, and scholastic time, the privilege of the scholar to freeze time in its tracks, slow it down, rerun it again. But unlike in many academic books, here the clash is productive and instructive. The irresistible force and the immovable rock discover points of contact and convergence that are ex externally illuminated. Finish something and move on? Never take work home? Not quite. Diane discovers that there is something that controllers also preserve forever, namely their mistakes. Their recollection of them is crystal clear even years later, just like an ethnographer. They're never finished with them and they never quite move on from them. As one of them says, if I shut my eyes, I can still see those two earthlings. They take these close poles home and they uh, turn them over in their heads again and again, gnawing on them until they are raw and painful. And even if they wanted to forget them, the group won't let them. They have nicknames for that. Uh, they are known forever among their peers by their worst moments. Like the guy named King, for example, for the time they allowed the flying elvises, the, the, the king, um, to parachute in uh, high winds and one of them died. Or Dave, who is mainly known for TWA 800, or the guy called Cement Head. You can you know, try to imagine why. This gallows humor uh, has a function. Controllers tell Diane that they are not stressed and that they do not con consider their job risky. On one level, this is of course true. Hey Diane, I, do I look stressed to you? One of them shouts over. <laughs> um, but in a beautiful section of the book, Diane dissects gallows humor to show that it is emotion work a way of working on oneself to produce the right emotional tenor for an air traffic controller. Always calm, never phased. The effort of this work reveals what it is working against, the emotional toll and stress generated by the work. It is also a crucible that you have to go through in order to become a true expert. You are cemented, quote unquote, precisely because you're actually very good at what you do. If you weren't, you wouldn't earn this name. Trainers know that. They say that you, you have to let, and I'm quoting the guy, let someone get to the point of making a very, very critical mistake and then learn by that. And when this happens, the body takes over. The mistake is experienced physically. My heart stopped, I was shaking. It's like a bucket of cold water in your face. But then they say, your awareness grows exponentially. It's hard to explain. It's just your vision, your scope, everything just grows. Gallows humor is a distantiated way of reliving this moment and searing again the lesson. On the other hand, the ethnographer believes, almost as a professional ethic, that she is on the side of her people, the people she observes and represents. But note how this controller 
complains about being investigated by management after having a deal. They take a decision you made in a fraction of a second with five other dis distractions going on, and they leisurely review it, have a cup of coffee, and tell you what you should have done. If we all only had 20 minutes to hit, to hit the Roger Clemens fastball. But isn't this what the ethnographer does too? Leisurely review her notes, take 20 minutes or 20 years. The ethnographer uncomfortably recognizes how similar she is to the auditors and supervisors whose job it is to interrogate and discipline. But part of the miracle of this book is that those polar opposites, the irresistible force and the immovable rock do not annihilate one another. Somehow they illuminate one another. They pull each other and the reader in front of the mirror. I want to end uh, by noting two uh, other ways in which this book is miraculous. First, this is a book about system effects. This is in the subtitle, but it is full of people, not cartoonish social actors, but flesh and blood people with all the quirks, foibles, pettiness, and heroism too. Maybe you need 600 pages to achieve this, but what Diane shows is that the expertise of controllers, the time consciousness, even their personality, their emotional uh, labor, and their humor are system effects. They are fundamentally shaped by the history of the Earth traffic control system, how it came together, how it apportions Earth space, the standards it imposes. But at the same time, Diane also shows that the system is a product of what people do. Earth traffic controllers make their own history, to paraphrase a certain talented author. At several places in the book, Diane repeats and juxtaposes two things that air traffic controllers told her. The first is structure and routine, structure and routine, the rules and regulations and how we respond that becomes automatic. If we have to improvise, we improvise from this pace. But the other controller says, you need neat and orderly, but you also need flexibility. And you also need the ability to just pull something out of the air. In sociological jargon, this is about structure and agency, both those books. But they each emphasize something somewhat different uh, about the duo. The first is about how agency is built from structure, the system effect. But the second is about how structure is woven by agency. The system is made out of its effects. This becomes clear when Diane returns to Boston Center after 9-11. The system is in the process of being rewired. The rules and regulations are there. They occupy two eight-inch thick binders placed in the middle of the watch desk. But what they mean is anybody's guess. Supervisors congregate around the binders, trying to settle on a collective interpretation that they can communicate back to the controllers. Gradually, the system is rewoven, not from the new rules and restrictions, but from how the rules are interpreted, bent, or even ignored by the controllers. That from the vantage point of the ethnographic revisit after 9-11, it reveals that this is how it works all the time. The system is constantly made and remade out of the system's effects. Now, the other miracle that happens in this book can be stated in brief. When did you last read a book or an article in science studies or in organizational sociology or in the sociology of profession that did not destroy or at least diminish um, your trust in the expert system that it dissected. After reading the Challenger launch decision, I decided I'm not going to the moon. <laughs> After reading uh, Owen Woolley's On the Hills of Ignorance, I lost any trust if I had in psychiatry. But I just finished reading 600 pages about the air traffic control system, and I actually feel a little bit more sanguine about flying. <laughs> I understand far better how the miracle of taking off and landing without ending in fiery death is accomplished. And I'm feeling more assured, well, I was after I read, but after I read chapter 12, I'm not so sure. Uh, how is it that ethnographic observation, fully attentive to the social construction of air traffic control, does not end up deconstructing its object and leaving it forever ungainly, entrails exposed, no longer able to win our trust? What is the secret sauce, Diane? Please tell us because we need a lot more of it. Did you read me that last? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, wonderful, Jill. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yes.
Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I note that uh, with, with some, uh, you know, uh, trepidation as well as satisfaction that I'm actually surrounded by sociologists. <laughs> really a bit of a fish out of water. Let you <laughs> so well, thank you, Diane, for uh, inviting me to serve on this panel. And congratulations. Congratulations on this a terrific uh, accomplishments. I was just reflecting on uh, what uh, Gil said towards the end of his uh, speech. I just flew in from Houston, uh, <laughs> and I've been reading Diane's book for the past <laughs> two weeks, uh, getting ready for this uh, panel. And uh, my first concern was, you know, with all the delays and so on, and I'm sure it must have crossed uh, Diane's mind that uh, my flight is not delayed, that, uh, you know, this becomes an issue. So thankfully, it arrived on time, but both during takeoff uh, a couple of days ago and then, you know, landing today, uh, despite all the optimism you have in the book, and, and as Gil pointed out, uh, that, you know, Diane explains how tenuous this whole system is and that we really have to work at it to, to keep its integrity. And uh, it's not going to be reliable all the time by itself. In fact, there are forces at work which are actually eating away at, uh, at its core in some ways. Uh, for the first time in many, many, many years, I was a bit nervous on a plane, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Diane's book. <laughs> so, but but it is it is an optimistic story, and uh, it is something all the air traffic controllers can be very proud about for the work they do. Uh, I mean, I mean, if it were up to me, I would double their salaries. I mean, this is not the place where you negotiate salaries. You know, you know every four seconds, they typically, on average, decide on the lives of 200 people. That's the average capacity of a plane at any given time. Uh, you know, any, any decision they make about a plane, there are 200 lives there. And so uh, this is not where you negotiate minimum wage. So, you know, you want to pay them well enough that they... One, they don't want to strike. They actually come to work and they are happy to come to work and they do their best job. And, and we attract the best minds to come for that kind of work. Anyway, that's a different story. Uh, so when Diane and I spoke about this, um, she asked me to kind of give a systems engineering perspective. So I'm a professor of chemical engineering and my students and I, we develop mathematical models of risk uh, in complex dynamical uh, systems. The idea is to be able to predict the level of risk so that we can control it, possibly eliminate it uh, wherever we can. So this is a bit of a, an engineer's uh, take, uh, you know, a little more nuts and bolts and nerdy. Uh, sorry about that, <laughs> but that's the <laughs> nature of the job. <laughs> so uh, as the slide uh, shows, you know, there's a lot of technology here and which, uh, you know, Dan goes into in great detail in these various chapters. But an air traffic control system is more than a set of equipment and, and, and the procedures. Uh, it's what we call as a socio-technical system where the social component uh, is in fact more important than the technology component. Because, um, and then statistics show in uh, other such socio-technical systems such as a chemical plant failures, which also by and large chemical plants are quite safe. Uh, but they do fail once in a while, but when they fail, it's uh, you know front page story in New York Times. And you know, mm -hmm. dozens, sometimes hundreds, and in the worst case, thousands of people die. And so uh, typically these accidents occur due to human errors. Uh, something like 70% of the time, it's really human mistakes rather than equipment failing. That way, you know, the, the human component of these socio-technical systems are very important. 
uh, and uh, they are full of these self-interested agents. They are trying to do the best uh, in order to uh, deliver the minimal risk uh, to the system. And if you look at it, and again, you know, it's really a systems perspective that is what she's providing. Uh, it's a complex network of interactions among equipment, processes, people, incentives, regulatory policies, and, and the overall environment in which uh, they work. And so, so over the years, we have looked at these kinds of systems, not air traffic control, but my students and I have looked at chemical plant failures. We have studied the Columbia and Challenger disasters, where you have written a book about, and uh, the failure of um, um, in a chemical plant accidents like Bhopal, uh, and then uh, Fukushima nuclear uh, uh, thing, and then uh, uh, the Northeast power failure in 2003. So we've looked at uh, a mining disaster in West Virginia. So over the years, we have looked at a variety of these systems to understand how and where these uh, uh, you know, particularly catastrophic failures happen, uh, where the whole system collapses. And it turns out, you know, complex systems don't fail because one thing go wrong, one thing goes wrong somewhere, or some, one person made a mistake somewhere. It's usually a number of things go wrong. In fact, I've been going wrong for a long time. It builds up. And, and so each time when somebody cuts a corner in, in order to save some money, usually that is the case, or say save some time sometimes, uh, they are eating away at the safety margins, which we as design engineers put into the system. But if you do this for a long enough period, you've eaten away all the safety margins and then anything, any one thing could make this thing uh, uh, you know, fail. For example, the, um, uh, when BP oil spill occurred in uh, the Gulf Coast in 2010, um, people looked into uh, the OSHA citations uh, in, in uh, BP organizations and they found that leading up to the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon accident, uh, as an organization, BP had about 800 violations, small and large. These are OSHA inspectors coming and then kicking the tires, you know, surprise inspections, and then no noticing, you know, deviations from safe operating procedures here and there. Something could be as simple as not wearing you know, proper protection uh, equipment or something a little more serious. So there were 800 citations. Whereas in the same period, uh, competition for BP, other oil companies, such as I think Sonico, had seven or eight citations and ExxonMobil had exactly one. Mm. So if I wear the BP for operations for BP and looking at these numbers, I won't be able to sleep at night in the night, right? So, because these numbers tell me that it's the, the, if there is going to be an accident, it's not the question when there is going to be an accident, because this is the people are violating all kinds of things here and there. That it's a question of when and not if. And then, sure enough, this thing happened. And there were similar leading statistics for the West Virginia mine disaster as well. So, so the reason I mention all these things because we've been looking at these kinds of things through my center uh, in the engineering school, which Diane is a part of, where we have studied going around the, uh, uh, the various uh, figures there, SARS epidemic, what led to that global, and then we are currently studying the causes and consequences of this particular one. The central figure there you see is the BP Deepwater Horizon, then comes the, the space shuttle disasters, Johnson & Johnson had to recall uh, 100 million bottles of children's Tylenol because of a catastrophic failure in the quality control in the supply chain. Lehman Brothers failure belongs to the same class of, I mean, the global financial crisis belongs to the same class of systems, not least. And global warming is another example of systemic failure where the system is the entire planet now. And so, uh, so within this, we have developed this seven layer uh, hierarchy. And then, so I, I went back and looked at Diane's work and see how we would look at it from a systems engineering perspective and where all your analysis and observations and results fit in. And the kind of things you just mentioned and also in the book, in, in the seven layer model of where things go wrong, um, 
all the way from the individual equipment at the bottom, then you have clusters of these things. These are, you know, like the radars and the various other, uh, you know, dead reckoning uh, technologies people use. Then comes the control tower view of the air traffic system. Then the regional center view, which is a more agglomerated. So as you go from the bottom to the top, it is as if you're zooming out and then you're, you know, seeing bigger and bigger picture. And then when you go down to the bottom, you're zooming in and you can go all the way down to a particular radar, which is sending you some signal. And then there are, and so this can be organized in the form of the seven layer pyramid where there's information that bubbles up to the top and then information comes down from the top. From the top would be, for example, policies, uh, you know, government uh, making, uh, you know, whether it's a regulatory or deregulatory uh, environment uh, and so on. So, so we've been looking at it, looking at all these things. So we have studied these 13 different uh, failures, you know, after reading the book, I've made a note that I need to sit down with you to go over <laughs> this thing in some more detail. Uh, and then because we found that there are about 700 different failures that have happened in these 13 disasters that we have studied, which can be classified into these primary categories of monitoring failures, decision-making failures, action failures, communication failures, and structural failures. And so that prompted me to, you know, think about a bunch of questions which I sent to Diane in advance so that she can have some time thinking about them. So what are the different classes of failures that she saw in her work with respect to the air traffic system? And, and you know, what do they teach us about uh, why they happen and how they happen? What about analysis of near misses data, you know, when things, planes come very close to each other? Uh, and um, uh, how do top-down policy changes affect, uh, uh, you know, things up and down the hierarchy, for example? Uh, like, uh, as she mentioned, the uh, two shocks to the system. One of them was, uh, uh, was Reagan firing all the uh, uh, controllers. So that's, that's again, a top-down uh, policy change. So... How did the system actually uh, react at these different levels? Similarly, how do bottom up? It's empowering people at the bottom is absolutely important because they are the ones who know what is going on in the system and they need to be part of any changes and standardization. And I'm glad President Clinton's administration did that. And the other thing I was wondering about, particularly when Diane mentioned about how uh, this particular air traffic controller recognized a flight which came across the Atlantic and uh, then he needed to make a hole for that person to come in and all that. So, you know, I was, you know, where they're anticipating moves and what kind of things they need to do. This is sort of like chess masters playing a chess game where they anticipate various, uh, uh, you know, role of the adversary and then making, you know, uh, appropriate uh, things. So, we, you know, we have some ideas about how chess masters think about the various, uh, you know, pieces on the board and then how they cluster them and so on. How do air traffic uh, controllers think about their chessboard, which is, which is, you know, all the planes moving about? What are the mental models there? I think it's a fascinating opportunity there. And uh, the other thing is uh, artificial intelligence is going to play a role going forward. So what, what, what's going to be AI's role for air traffic for control automation? In fact, my students and I work basically on AI for automation of chemical plants. And then how do we build training simulators so that uh, you know, as more automation comes in, people are going to lose their expertise, as you point out, as de-skilling, as you say. So how do we keep the skill level uh, on, you know, uh, you know, on top and then, uh, you know, reduce that sort of deterioration? So these are some of the things that came up in my mind. And uh, But overall, I really enjoyed your book and, uh, uh, and, and I'm glad to know that uh, uh, you know, the situation, uh, as, as Gil pointed out, is actually more optimistic than it is yeah. not, in, uh, you know, which is usually the case. Uh, but we cannot take it for granted, as you also caution us, that we really have to make sure that um, uh, the system continues to deliver. And again, thank you again for the opportunity. And my apologies to Harlow for running a little bit over time, as usual. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Venka. And, and now last we have Ida. Yes, so our final speaker is um, coming from Zoom, uh, over Zoom from Japan. So oh, I'm actually going to ask our panelists mm -hmm. to move into the audience so that you can see as well. 
And can we take off the um, uh, the shared screen? Yes, I will do that in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the morning in Japan. So if you have any questions about what the future looks like, uh, I can, I can answer that. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's really a fantastic pleasure uh, to, to talk about Diane Vaughan's book. I mean, um, Diane's work has been formative, I think, for me and for, 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 a, lot of, for a lot of ethnographers for how, for how we think about our objects and, ha and how, to take, um, how to take both a case and object a field really seriously in a way that, uh, you know, that, that ethnographers often say they do when, and, sometimes do less than they say they do. And, and, um, and Dan's book is really a model for, for, for kind of staying with the object, both in terms of the time, but, but also analytically and kind of slowly teasing it out. And, um, and one thing, you know, I mean, uh, this, is, this is a thick book as, as Gil has, has, has shown, it's, uh, uh, but it's it's a riveting book to read. I mean, when I when I kind of got the book in the mail, you know, I was like, okay, I can I have to kind of prepare myself for it. And then I found myself really not able to to take it, you know, to put it down. Often, I mean, just in terms, you know, both analytically, but also in terms of the narrative, in terms of kind of getting uh, people's perspective. And I think one of the things that makes this such an accomplishment is. Um, you know, when we when we do when we do uh, when we do an ethnography, um, we we bring to life a certain kind of uh, of scene of, but also kind of an interactional exchanges, and here you have uh, kind of a field site where where the exchanges are often very kind of quiet, in monotone almost, extremely heavy jargon. Um, it's, it's an incredible hard kind of place to tease out the narrative because, because the, the, the field site itself seems to kind of resist it. And yet what Diane shows is if you stay enough with the phenomenon, you can really kind of show the, the, the narrative drama of it in, in a really uh, terrific way. And I think also uh, if we think in terms of time, in terms of kind of long time ethnography, this ethnography joins really a handful of, of, of ethnographic works uh, that take a very kind of long-term perspective. And here, of course, Dan did, did a lot of historical work, but she's also just been on and off in the field for 20 years. And, and I think, you know, again, if you think in terms of ethnographies, there's, there's Robert Smith on Mexican New York, there's Tim Black, When a Heart Turns Rock Solid, but, but you can count these kinds of ethnographies uh, basically on one hand. And, um, and I think one of the things that, that she really shows is how taking such a perspective allows us to, to ask different questions and to kind of tackle different theoretical uh, concerns. So what I wanna to do today is just pull on, on a couple of threads uh, that I found fascinating in the book and, and kind of think about them and what else one may do with them. And I found myself kind of, writing down the margins of the books, like all the ways in which like, oh, now I can compare this. Now I can think about, you know, another kind of set of, of, of ideas for, for projects. So here's, so, so let me start and, and, and Gil um, mentioned this uh, briefly in, in his comments. The idea that, that being an air controller uh, and, and a lot of the air controllers that, that Diane spoke with and hung out with told her that really changes you. Right. I mean, so if you're an, an air controller, you have to be incredibly assertive and and as again, Gil said, to maximize time. Right. I mean, everything has to happen. Four seconds is a huge amount of time. Things have and people have to listen to. you, 
right? If somebody does not listen to you, there's like a whole set of vocabulary that, that Diane kind of allows us to glimpse. Like if an air controller said, please expedite your, uh, your turn, that means he's really serious. And if an air controller says, do it now, then this is something that's almost unprecedented and people hit the brakes like no tomorrow. So what, what she shows and, and what people have talked to her uh, as she did the book is how these, this kind of professional habitus, right? This kind of professional mode of seeing, of, of, of being in the world overflows um, the job. I mean, so in one way, it's the things that we perhaps uh, would expect. So they go on the highway and they're constantly seeing patterns in the highway and they're thinking, okay, there's a hole here. I will let this car go in and then I will drive. Not unlike if, if you had the, the, you know, the, the bad luck of, of getting into Tetris at some point, then, then you look at everything and you think to yourself, oh, if I move the door here, the whole thing will disappear, right? I think you, you might have had that kind of experience. Um, but it's also, as, they've talk, as they talked about, a kind of personality change, right? People who used to be shy are no longer shy. They talk about kind of A-type personality. Um, and I was trying to think about what makes these kind of uh, professional habitus overflows more or less, um, more or, or, or less likely. Because I think we can think about different jobs. I mean, any job has a kind of professional habitus that is, um, that's attached to it in a certain way, um, whether it is uh, washing dishes in a restaurant or being an air controller or being a manager. And yet I think they overflow uh, into, different, um, into different domains differently. And I was trying to think like, well, what is it about air control uh, that, makes it, that makes it so powerfully uh, overflow its professional boundaries. And I thought about two things. And again, these are just, these are just, I don't know, semi-hypotheses, like half-baked hypotheses that we can kind of think about. But one is uh, how interactional is the work? Because I think one of the things that, that, that Diane shows is they're constantly working with the people, right? They're working with the pilots, they're working with other controllers, they're working with other centers, tray cons, towers. They're constantly having to kind of have their, their you know, the work is inherently interactional in this way, right? In which other forms of work are, in, are less interactional or less, you know, or, or maybe the interaction is more with technology or with the task than it is with, with other people. So is there a way in which the more interactional the work, the more overflow, the more, the more it overflows? But the other thing that's incredibly important and interesting is that um, the work is, in one way, it's very routine, right? You go every day, and there's a set of planes this is, and you have to land them. And, and you know, your goal is always in some sense the same goal to have the, the, the planes be um, far enough from each other that they won't crash, right? And if they, they kind of get too close to each other, they call it, it was a deal, right? Like, like it was a situation. Um, but on the other hand, there's it's constantly, constantly changing. And you have to constantly, um, it's a kind of, it's an incredibly flexible kind of workplace where you have to kind of interactionally solve an incredibly complex array of problems in a very, very short time. And I, I wonder whether actually this flexibility uh, is apt to create more overflow in terms of kind of your professional habitus to, to other domains of your life. Um, so, so you have kind of this professional habitus, but, but then, um, you know, another kind of thing that, that was really um, fascinating, I think, about the book is this notion that, that traffic controllers constantly talk about the personality of airlines, of centers, of people as well. Um, and I think Diane has, here has this kind of ability that, that some ethnographers have to really listen um, 
and, and latch on to certain terms, certain ways of thinking that her field um, offers her and kind of really try to say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean for a center to have a personality? How does a center come to have a personality? And I think it, in some sense, when I first read it, I thought, well, you know, of course it's a, it's a metaphorical thing, you know, airlines don't have personalities, you know, organizations don't have personalities, but of course, that might be wrong, right? If we think about a kind of a personality as a, as a kind of a disposition to react and act in particular ways uh, in particular situations, right? Like what does it mean to have a kind of uh, giving personality or uh, a sweet personality, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's about a kind of disposition to act, react in particular ways, both in terms of action and perhaps in terms of kind of the emotion work that goes into it in particular situations. Then one of the things that, um, that Diane really manages to show is how especially centers really kind of come to have something like a personality, right? And, and this is part of the socio-technical accomplishment, right? The socio-technical accomplishment that has to do with how people are sitting, the acoustics of the room, the kind of technology, the kind of airspace that they're dealing with. The, what all of this creates is precisely what, in some sense, non-metaphorically we can think about as a personality, right? Again, the kind of dispositions to react and act in particular ways. And in that way, um, the, her interlocutors really are onto something that we can think about more as sociologists, right? About how organizations, how um, particular kind of assemblages come to have something like a personality. Um, I also wanna just say, um, Theoretically, there's something just, just, and that's true for all of Dan's work, but it's really um, striking in this book. There's kind of this effortless um, weaving in of different theoretical um, kind of concerns. I mean, I think if somebody else would have written the same book, I could have imagined a kind of um, unbelievably abstruse actor network theory, jargon, new materialities about the way that, and Dan allows us to see exactly these kinds of things, but with minimal jargon and really trying to kind of tease out, like, what does it mean that a specific radar is doing something of one sort? What does it mean? What, what happens when, you know, your, um, radios stop working, your handheld stop working, how people can kind of work within the world and, and within the kind of um, material uh, rooting of their world to make their, to make their work doable is something that's constantly there. Um, the, last, the last couple of things I wanna, I wanna talk about, and I hope I won't go uh, way over time. Uh, one is, and, and again, this is something that, that Gil has, has kind of mentioned, the kind of uh, emotional stance of these people. And here I know, I know that when you have uh, 640 pages, the last thing you want to say is, I wanted to know more. But I did want to know more, <laughs> but I did want to know more uh, about one of the things that was really striking is, um, is the kind of ways in which, I mean, of course, this work can be very, very stressful and you see it when something goes wrong, right? I mean, the, the way in which people, you know, can relive these kind of deals, the kind of close calls that they had and the disasters uh, years later um, shows the kind of, um, in some sense, um, background or, um, of, of, of kind of, of high stakes and, and, the, and, and a high pressure workplace. But on the other hand, they constantly tell her like, look, people constantly tell us that it's gonna be, that it's high stress. And we actually sometimes don't even wanna say that we're air controllers because people are gonna ask about it. And it's actually not stressful. Like one of them says like, my life is stressful. I'm getting divorced. I can't control anything here, here. That's like the least stress I have. And I thought that was really, really interesting, right? If we take it seriously. I mean, so part of it really has to do with the kind of process of socialization that Diane describes and the ways in which immense amounts of both kind of modes of cognition and, and just huge amounts of knowledge becomes rooted and routine so that they can 
solve these kind of constant kind of pro problem situations that they're within. Um, but I was thinking about uh, something that the Dan doesn't talk about a lot, which is like, what's the, what's the rate of burnout in this, in, this, uh, in this profession, right? I would, I would assume that a profession like this in which you make these constant high stake decisions uh, that demands so much of you cognitively uh, will have very high burnout uh, and which in some sense the rhythm is so fast will have a very high burnout and I you know and partly this is just a kind of lay expectation but partly I've, I've done an ethnography of advertising professionals and advertising is in a very very different way is another place where things are constantly going incredibly fast and you have a very very high rate of burnout like people drop off uh, people have, you know, mental breakdowns, uh, and this is something that happens routinely. Um, it doesn't seem to be working that way in Diane's um, field site. Uh, and I was wondering why. Uh, so maybe it's just that we don't see it and it really happens. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's a question for Diane. But if not, then I wondered what would explain in, in kind of, if we think comparatively about places where you have an incredibly fast paced, fast rhythm of, of work with high stakes, for some of them to be more um, emotionally taxing in terms of burnout, in terms of, of, of mental collapse uh, than others. And what I was thinking about, and this is where I wanted to know a little bit more, is what is the structure of careers? Because what seemed to also be the case that once you get in to become an, an air traffic controller, uh, which is harrowing and difficult and weeds out people who can't handle stress in a certain kind of way and who can't handle the task, and, and, and Dan kind of spends a lot of time showing that and I think it's really, really useful. But once you're there, um, there is quite it seems to be a pretty secure place, even though if you have uh, over three deals a year, if you have kind of three serious kind of infractions a year, you can be fired. Uh, it looks like it's pretty rare. And I wondered whether partly what's going on is that once you're there, even though the job itself is very, very stressful, it's also a very safe job, both in the sense that you feel that you kind of feel that you have control over a world that looks chaotic, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, living in a, you know, having our personal lives being chaotic in particular ways that we cannot control. But also in the sense that you know that even though that there's this chaos, the job itself is secure. And I wanted to know a little bit more about it, even though you had these kinds of um, very serious, uh, you know, and, and Dan gets to it in the historical chapters, there's kind of this, big union fiasco uh, in which a huge amount of air controllers were fired. Um, even given this, uh, the, the, the kind of, it seems to be a kind of rooted in a very strong sense of job security. And I wondered about it. Um, there's more things that I, I wanted to talk about, but I will I'll stop here uh, for time. But thank you so much for letting me read it and think about this work, Dan. So, uh, so uh, before we open the floor and uh, uh, hear questions from you all, and thank you very much, Ido, too. It's good to see you. And uh, uh, I want to turn to Diane and uh, and ask her uh, if you'd like to respond. I would, and first I want to say thank you all for such careful attention to a long book, <laughs> a long detailed book, and, um, and how much I appreciate the range of ideas that you have raised in terms of the, how, the, how the arguments and the data 
the work. Um, I, I think I'll follow the order. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled that you remembered all the, like you've been able to absorb all the little details by the clipboard and, <laughs> and the nicknames and all those wonderful things that I just love. I, I want to say that these people are amazing to be around. And um, to, to Ida's general question, I, I, I'll apply this later, but they can be, they're incredibly direct, which is how they have to be with pilots. But they're also so funny. I mean, the, the things that they do, I walked into the Boston Tower one day, and they, they would tend to, depending on where I was, uh, they would tend to forget me, uh, especially in the radar rooms, which were dark. And so I got to see a lot of things that ordinarily <laughs> I probably wouldn't have. And um, the, there are five positions in all air traffic control towers. And the three that talk to the pilots the most are called the front row. And the front row all started, for some reason, I missed why they did it, but they all started doing cable exercises while they're talking to the airplanes in rhythm. I mean, yes, okay. <laughs> Um, but but they're like the joking that they do is also um, in line with what you were talking about about the sense of humor. Um, one controller said, "There's nothing too cruel if it's funny enough." And the way they zing each other up, and the aspect of of being a controller means that's a part of the job. And one of the supervisors told me that when the women get as good as they get. And this kind of camaraderie helps to bind diverse people together. It's not, not everyone's happy with it, um, but there's a tend to interpret it as if they're singing on me, I'm a member of the group. And indeed, one of the people said, um, actually, this was a person at Bedford. She said, we sit there for a long time and we don't have a lot of traffic. And so we begin, you know, talking about each other, which is something I never like to do. She said, but I think that there's something about it, that that's the only way we get keep our energy up when traffic is low is to stimulate each other so that we don't have to go from zero to a full stop. So even the humor has a function in their eyes, but she's the only person that said that to me. And I wouldn't have thought of it, I don't think, but just insights came multiply. Um, on your, so your comments were really great. Um, I think in this last, this, you seriously wanted me to respond to this. I, I'm going to frame this. <laughs> um, um, he said, um, how is it that ethnographic observation fully attended to the social construction of air traffic control does not end up deconstructing its object and leaving it forever, ungainly in trails exposed, no longer able to win our trust? Um, you know, I think a lot of that depends on the subject matter. Um, and the amount of time that you can spend in a facility. It's not, you know, the different conceptions of time um, between our chief, our profession and their profession um, that you know, we marked on is uh, really central. And that conversation when you're still here really struck me about the different ways we operate it. And they take that home with them. And, you know, I operate differently because I work in a different profession. Um, but I think it's crucial with that photography, especially, to spend a long time in the field. So the fact that I was willing to stay 12 hours a day and see two different shifts, 
the different crews have different personalities. Um, and so the work is different as a consequence by the way that people work together. But I do think that that um, phenomenon, I'm trying to think about that couple. Uncoupling was also a historical process book, and it was a lot of individual stories put together in a historical process of a transition. And that the people who spoke to me were willing to spend long hours with me because they needed somebody to talk to, apparently. And I was the neutral stranger. So but that doesn't give me this bright, rosy feeling that, you know, that you're safe on the airplane or that you analogically you're safe in the relationship. That makes you worry about your relationship. So I think that the subject matter does make a difference. Um, and so I did bring with me your chart. I think it's, um, he also, as you notice, he doesn't just study engineering systems, he studies human systems, which is why that I thought you really belonged here, because you have different kinds of data than I do. And I thank you for being on the panel so much. Um, I, I tried to answer some of your questions, but we're going to save a lot of them for a private conversation. But uh, what are the different classes of failures and risk categories? This was, I, I thought this was really interesting. They, um, air traffic controllers don't think about failure because they're not trained to avoid collisions. They're trained to pay attention to the rules of separation. And if you do that, you don't have to worry about collisions. But they do think a lot about mistakes and errors. And these are in different categories that have to do not simply with risk to others, but risk to themselves mm -hmm. that they see it. So an operational error is a violation of the rules of separation. Mistakes are something that everybody can do, but a violation of the rules of separation is also called a deal, called having a deal. And the consequences of having a deal is that if you have three deals, you're out. And that doesn't have to be an accident that happened due to this, but just if you have three deals, you're out. Um, but you are immediately sanctioned. You are pulled off of your position. And there is a special hearing. The tapes of the conversations between you and the pilots are, are copied out. And you meet with your supervisor and a union representative and some other person the higher in the hierarchy, like the air traffic manager. Um, and you may be pulled off for training. So there's a heavy sanction for that. So when they do that, it's a risk. It's a risk to themselves. But mistakes are serious. And, but I don't think they come in really, well, they do come, there's the mistake is a failure to do something that doesn't have any consequences. And then there's a mistake like you miss something, right. which has consequences. So there are categories too at the individual level. The um, on an analysis of near misses data, the um, they do that in the larger facilities uh, locally, but nationally they do it. And near misses locally. Um, Sometimes are sanctioned and then sometimes are not. But at the national level, there was one time um, it, when I was there in 2017, mm -hmm. when there were four near misses at major airports, towers, uh, that were almost of the same kind. And these resulted in um, uh, changes in policy mm -hmm. that were standardized across all the system. All the, all the different kinds of facilities that were towers, um, but it affected TRACOMs too because of the, the, work, the traffic flows into the tower. Um, 
but the causes of the mistakes because the airspace differs, the causes of the mistakes are different at each place and standardized changes don't always fit the local situation. And in this, in this uh, partic particular change, the ground controllers were told that you need to tell pilots to stop at East Crossing intersection. And if you previously, you didn't do that. You gave them one and said to proceed to so-and-so. Uh, so this happened on the ground? Yes. Not, this, not in the air. Right. Um, no, it happened in the air, but it had to do with the ground, ground. control. Oh, okay. and, um, and the other thing was that, um, Oh, so she had to make the change of announcing to each pilot the car to have them announce and tell them at each crossing point. And this added 18 seconds to each plane. And this threw everything off for her because it's a small airspace with crossing runways. And so it's really hard to tell how what's the positive and the negative of that. Um, training simulators for new personal personnel, yes, they have that, they've had that a lot of time. These going from over automation, yes, they have too. Um, the last chapter is about, uh, you ask about top-down policy changes. Um, the last chapter is about how a perfectly organized change had unanticipated consequences that had uh, huge effects on controllers. And they, this was when not only did they automate, but the automation plan was more full in terms of modernization by, they wanted to consolidate all radar facilities and for, for all the TRACONs, I'm sorry. They wanted to consolidate all the TRACONs, but they've done that successfully with large TRACONs that all had the same airspace. But in at Boston, TRACON was an experiment and they were going to put smaller TRACONs with less complex airspace into Boston Tricot. So there would be three in the new building. And they, it wasn't through any fault of their own that they didn't predict the kinds of consequences because they're not used to thinking about these things. But first of all, all these places were in small dark rooms with elbow to elbow. And as one person said, we moved from a shoebox to an airplane hangar. It had a high ceiling. There was a, it wasn't dark. The physical layout was wrong. And the, it was still the concept of the airspaces would be integrated. So that meant that all controllers would be able to work all the airspace. But the Manchester controllers from the smaller facility were used to a simpler, they had a different culture way of sort of doing things. They didn't have the same kind of practice with crossing runways. And the first one they tried to train failed. And so this was the chapter where it was like controllers engaged in repairing. This is one I didn't hear about, but I got to see it. But the, the point was that there were terrible resentments and and conflict between them rather the kind of cooperative categories that you need for controllers to coordinate as they're supposed to. Um, and it was really dysfunctional and increased risk. And so, but they just couldn't foresee this. And I think in terms of your work, the greater the complexity of the system, the greater potential of failure, no matter how prepared, and how organized they are. So more on that later. And Ida, thank you so much for coming in. You're still up there. Can you see me? <laughs> um, the, 
I was I was really excited to see how you were able to take the the qualitative data of the book and apply it in analogical circumstances that applied to other kinds of professions. I know you've got a book coming out too on professions, so you've been thinking a lot about that. Um, the like special language, the, the occupational professional habitus that you mentioned, and the special language like personality and how it applies to other possible situations or circumstances. Um, this was um, how controllers distinguished one facility's characteristics from another. Um, they have a funny personality. And it refers for them to the social organization of work. Um, but it also means that we can think of personalities as you were using in Nido in terms of, of social organization in general, and especially pro professional modes of seeing and doing and being together. The, um, this professional habitus and the overflow of it, um, I think that would be an interesting uh, research study to do. Would it be the same for, say, psychologists? I, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe for them, maybe for psychologists. But um, the, I think it's important to remember that air traffic control is an exotic case. Um, it's different from other kinds of organizations. First, in the fact that most of the people in it work air traffic, and they've been trained similarly. Um, and they speak the same language and they have the same ways of doing things. There's variation between facilities, but what other kind of organization do you know um, that is also equally standardized, which creates a struggle for controllers because uh, on the one hand, there are struggles because they have to be tailored to work in local situations. Like how, how can we make this work here? On the other hand, the rules of procedures are one of their, what I call technologies of coordination and control. I did not study, I, I redefined technology to cover more than just the scopes and the keyboards and the mics and the headset. But for example, the rules and regulations are one, but the special glass and tower windows that keeps the noise of the airplanes out, which uh, the, uh, the architecture of the room is a technology of co coordination and control, uh, various things. And the, um, these are all standardized in the facilities that are alike. And so it's hard to compare this with other kinds of professions that don't work in the same place and that are more hierarchical um, where people aren't all trained to like, like a lot, like everyone except the the uh, politically appointed officials in Washington have been air traffic controllers. So, so that's something to think about. But I love the concept of overflow. And how does it overflow with us? Um, Oh, um, the technical failures you pointed out, you were talking about the when the equipment fails and how they have to carry on. This is some of the extraordinary things that controllers do, but, you know, I've been doing interviews on microscope 
Microsoft Teams lately. And every time it has been a major failure and a lot of my time is like, anyway, um, it doesn't just, <laughs> um, but, but the idea of um, how people respond to failures. I mean, if you're having a problem on virtual and you're giving a talk, but if you're having a problem with your computer, whatever kind of job is, if your equipment fails. There was a day that, um, that I was at Bedford and Bedford, the little places don't get a lot of resources. And the, when I started the study in 2000, the uh, equipment was 1960s equipment at every facility. And I was wearing a 1960s headset, just like they were, they were working in 1960. This is in 2000, computer scopes. Um, and this um, Bedford was in the worst shape. They had foot pedals to operate their mics, and those foot pedals were taped in place. And there were days when they came in and when they had to tape their foot pedals. But I was there on a Sunday, which is a high traffic day for them, because that's when the, what they call the weekend warriors come out, the people who don't really know how to fly that are coming out to use the airport and the pilots who are taking pilot lessons or training pilot lessons from the pilot schools. A lot, a lot of them speak, come here from the foreign countries and they don't speak English. And so there was a lot going on and all of a sudden their, the main microphone failed. And when they tried to use the handhelds, they had two handheld microphones. And both sets failed. And so what happened? The person who was the lead controller, it's called the local controller, had an idea. They went, they were, the other, there were three of them there. Um, and he's, he explained to me what he did afterwards because I didn't know, but he ran a, like a, a, an air traffic race, a racing competition where the air traffic controllers are in the back of a pickup truck and they have a different way of talking um, because pilots could hear nothing. So he, he signaled them, there was this old fashioned signal line and he signaled them about how they should indicate with tips of their wings and so on. And that, so this like, um, Rules, you know, the rules and order are is a is a very good thing, but there's going to come time for you when the rules are going to go out the window, and you're going to need an idea, and you better have it. And that was his idea, but that came from his history of moving up in the system from small to larger and larger. What? Why didn't one of them go to the local radio shack and pick up a mic? <laughs> Too far. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did call their air traffic manager back there after everything had been resolved. Somebody did come and help them. Okay. Um, but it was an hour. Yeah. Anyway, I'm rambling now. Um, Once I start talking about <laughs> air traffic control. We, we, we have a, a little bit of time uh, for questions. Why what, what don't we collect uh, a, a few questions and uh, and I, I uh, give Diane a chance to respond, and I think well, uh, I may have questions for uh, um, or or for Gil or uh, Venkat or Ego as well. Uh, but that will quickly take us to time. Uh, so uh, the floor is open, uh, virtually and and physically. Um, so I have another question. Sorry. Can you come stand in front of the <laughs> yeah. 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 So we're going to put something Yeah, stand there with this. Okay, sure. And so <laughs> and, and what we might do is collect a number of questions and uh, and do it that right. Sure, yes. but I will talk to Diane and not to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> So I have another question about the overflow of the professional habitus, which is something that I'm, I'm personally interested in. 
And I'm just curious because this is such a standardized form of behavior and, and kind of like an ethic basically that is expected of them. Every second counts, everything has to be very standardized. So one question is whether there's room for individual creativity or some variance that people bring into their professional actual um, communication with pilots and the way they organize uh, air traffic? That's one question. And the other is whether you have seen that this sort of demand for, um, for maximal efficiency and precision and, and cool headedness does seep into other domains in their lives. Like when they talk to their colleagues about how they should engage in their personal lives, do the values of efficiency and precision um, precipitate into that too? Okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Any more from the floor? We have one more question. Yeah, there are. I don't think we're seeing things in the chat. There are yeah, it's, 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 it's other, other stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, like all people who have PhDs, they have different levels of skill. And the level of skill you have determines the creativity or the person's creativity determines the level of skill. Um, and this has to do with technique and how you move your airplanes. And um, the, the way you see the traffic pattern, you have to have a plan A and a plan B. And the more experience you have, the better that you can plan the better you're dead reckoning and the more creative you can be. But the, the trick is to do the least work possible and accomplish the most. So they watch everything, but a lot of their work, their training is such and experience is such, but a lot of their skills are embodied so that they, some things they can do automatically. It's not that they're not thinking, but they just know how to do it automatically. And that frees you up to think about other things. So yes, there are those among them that are the most highly skilled or more highly skilled than others. Everyone is skilled, but they have different strengths. Who can get an airplane someplace else in the fewest moves, which is highly prized. The, um, the, the other thing is that aging makes a difference in that because they could work a lot faster and do more when they started, which is why the retirement, but, but about age 40, they feel themselves slowing down. And so they have to develop different methods of moving airplanes. They can't run them as close as they used to like to run them, for example. Um, and on, um, do these things go home with them? Did you mean other professions or controllers? Um, controllers. They, um, I asked this. Um, I noticed how intensive their training was. And um, half of them that try to go through the training fail. Um, and it involves a lot, like all the debt reckoning skills are taught in an apprentice system where you're working live traffic with the trainer yelling at you from behind with the clipboard or whatever. Um, um, and I said, I noticed the question was, I said, um, when, you're work, work, when you're working air traffic control, um, does any of the skills go home with you? And their responses were all of the order of talking, talking about uh, ways of speaking that they forget, like they sign off of a phone call with their, their 
control her initials did they sign off the speaker with but there were skills that went went home with them which was um being aggressive being controlling multitasking um my wife gets so mad at me because she can be talking to me and i'm not looking at her i'm doing something else and she doesn't think i hear her but i hear every word but you're not listening to me or and she gets only four seconds to respond right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's pretty much it actually. He, and he said when i asked that question he said um another person said I have a 13 year old son. Do I have to say more? I treat you like pilots. I'm going to ask you the first time. I'm going to tell you the second time. And the third time, you're going to do it like her. And they talk about be, be, being systematic and prioritizing and um, they can't stand a slow response. And I, I can remember, I don't think I put this in the book, but I can remember being at Bedford and he said, how did you happen to get into this project? And so I started and he said, it wasn't a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the second question after that, and the responses were, were very different. Um, but those were some of the main patterns that speed, you need, like you have to get this done quick so you can go on and do other things. Um, but the other question was, has, does any of this, do you feel that any of this has changed your persona, it's a fundamental change in persona? And most of them said yes. Some of them said that it enhanced skills or characteristics they already have. Um, but it, they talked about being controlling. Uh, the men talked about big egos. Uh, both men and women talked about being shy. Um, and now they weren't as shy as they were before. So one woman said, when she was a child, her parents gave her, um, what do you call this little radio station? Walkie talkies. No, it's no. Um, a symbol of, like, you can listen. A hand she, yes. And, and she said, I, I was too shy to use it. I didn't want to talk to other people. Oh, and she said, and I was also really shy when I went into, the, as an adult, when I went into the grocery store, um, I, I had a hard time asking somebody to help me. And she said, I'm much better now. When we worked here, she talked about all the razzing you get and all the heckling when you do make mistakes and you start to become harder. And she said, now it doesn't bother me as much to go and distort and ask somebody to help me. <laughs> but there's like, the other answers was I've become a bitch. So there are extremes in the way that they have responded. And I think the women responded more than the men. One woman talked about some of the characteristics that she is, became a very aggressive and take charge person. And um, that she didn't like that and assertive and she didn't like the way she was. And, and I said, and she said that, and then I said, um, she said, oh, she said, so, but, but by the time you finish your training, you're hard. And I said, is it better? And she said, no, it's not better. So it made her a different person, but it wasn't better. So yes, it does. And part of that is a function of the fact that they do this stuff every day. So that's part of it. So there's an occupational hazard kind of a... Yes, but it's also a, an advantage because they talk about when they go away for a two-week vacation, they have to start up really slowly because they are not as fast and they don't have these known skills, right? Yeah. 